Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm Bobby Sylvester with Mike Taglier, as always. Tags is still dealing with mono, but he's here with us once again. Tags, how are you holding up, man? <laughs> I'm doing good, Bobby. I actually, uh, I wanted to take a moment and just say uh, thank you for everybody that reached out to me, wishing me well through this sickness or whatever you want to call this virus. Um, but I, I, I want to give a special thanks to Patrick. He's one of our followers. Uh, he and uh, his partner say, he told me that they take road trips and uh, that we power them through these road trips. And they they, they own a company. It's called Tiesta T, like Fiesta, but with a T. And I'm not really a tea guy, but he he reached out to me and said, Mike, I, I really want to help out if I can. And I think this could help, you know, speed up your recovery. They sent me out this package. It has like an infuser. It's got all these teas. Like I'm not even a tea guy, but this stuff is fantastic. It's all natural stuff. And um, I wanted to give them a shout out on the podcast just to say thank you. Thank you so much. Like that's I, really I re- cool. Yeah, I really can't say enough about you. Um, so thank you, Patrick. And you guys, if you if you're tea drinkers, go Tiesta so our guest today is Pat Fitzmorris of thefootballgirl.com. He's also written for 444.com and SI.com. And he's not only one of the nicest guys in the industry, but Pat is also top five out of over 100 experts in our season-long expert accuracy competition. So make sure to pay close attention to what he recommends today. Pat, thanks for joining us. Oh, you're too kind, Bobby. And I might be sliding out of the rankings after this past week. I slipped a little bit, but uh, hopefully I can stay top 10. And by the way, small world, I also know Patrick of Tiesta T. He, uh, my stepbrother used to run a tea trade show. And uh, Patrick is also good friends with my cousin, Billy. So very small world. Wow. What Holy a small cow. world. Yeah, that's crazy. That's amazing. Yeah, Patrick's a good dude. I followed him and then like we've have been having conversations back and forth. But yeah, that's really that is such a small world. I'm happy to have you on, Pat. I know Pat and I actually got a chance to meet each other for the first time, even though he, he's he's like we live we live like a couple hours away from each other. and We've always tried to get together and we finally did uh, about a month ago. and We had that tweet up with all of our followers and stuff. So it was good to meet you, Pat. Yeah, absolutely. Tags. We got to do it more often for sure. Next time I'm definitely going to come. I'm going to make the, uh, the three hour trek up there. But, you know, we just had the new baby so it wasn't a good time to come Uh, there isn't (laughs) much in the way of news today Jake Fisher is now out for the season for the Bengals with an undisclosed illness I was joking with tags before the show like you know maybe he drank after one of your beers or something um, that that's a big blow to the Bengals offensive line it doesn't really change much in the fantasy landscape though because the Bengals already had a bad offensive line no, we didn't share a beer, but we did make out. So there's always that. Um, but I, 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 they said undisclosed. So I'm just going to say that it wasn't me, even though I already let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> I do want to talk about the Zeke thing again, though. His hearing is Thursday afternoon, which means we probably won't hear the verdict until after Sunday. That means he's probably going to play. And Sunday fantasy owners likely won't have Ezekiel Elliott for any of the fantasy playoffs. That's going to be a bummer. Uh, Pat, what's your take on this? Like, are you if someone let's pretend that we have someone listening right now who owns Zeke and they're like, you know what? He hasn't gotten suspended at this point. Why should I sell him? Should they be selling him to somebody who who also believes that he won't be suspended? Or are you of the mindset that keep him and he's going to work for he's going to work out? I've, I've gotten some interesting questions from people who were offered deals for Zeke Elliott. And at what level do you cash out? You know, people were one guy got Kareem Hunt for an offer. And even though Hunt's been sliding a little bit lately, I said, by all means, cash out, you know, take the insurance. Uh, Yeah, I'm so oblivious on the legal matters that I just have no way of gauging what Mm -hmm. what is possibly going to work out. I mean, I know a lot of people have for weeks, just been trying to back themselves up with either Alf Morris or Rod Smith or, or uh, Darren McFadden, you know, and so far, all of it's been for naught as this uh, has just been dragged out through the courts. And it's going to be kind of funny if all the fab money that's been spent on Dallas backups over the course of the season just is all going to waste. I mean, if if all those fab dollars could be used in real dollars, I think I could pretty much retire comfortably with all of that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, it, I guess we'll know quite a bit more uh, in the days to come. And uh, yeah, I've got Zeke in at least one league, so I'm kind of crossing my fingers here. I think it's fair to say here that Everybody wants to know what's going on, but nobody really does. I've talked to a legal expert about this, and he told me every single time he was very confident what was going to happen, and each time he's been wrong so far. Um, so there's just really no telling what's going to happen here. Like, it seems like Zeke is probably going to play one more week and then be out until week 17 when he doesn't matter. But 
I guess there's a chance he actually ends up playing the rest of the season. So I was going to say, go ahead and just trade him for like whatever get at this point. I mean, you're going to miss one week where he's going to provide probably 15 to 20 points, but there's a chance that he plays. So I'm wondering where the cutoff is. Like, would you guys trade him for Adrian Peterson, Christian McCaffrey, or is that too much? Um, I'd take McCaffrey for him. Uh, Adrian Peterson, eh, not so much. I'm not so excited yeah, about him. Yeah. He's not going to play the 49ers every single week. I mean, the cutoff for the cutoff for me is like in that Joe Mixon, Christian McCaffrey, Jarek McKinnon area. That's the area that I'd look for. Cause I think those guys are, they're every week starters. They're going to contribute. You know, they're not going to blow the roof off, but at the same time, I'm, I'm looking to deal Zeke if I, if I can. Like the guys behind him, Amir Abdullah, uh, even Chris Thompson, I'm not sure I want to start them every week in a standard league. PPR, oh, definitely with with Chris Thomas, but uh, I'm not sure that I would trade Zeke for that just in case he does come back. Yeah, that's it, it, there's a, there's a thin line, and that's where it's like those are the questionable guys like Chris Thompson, Amir Abdullah, you know, Demarco Murray, C.J. Anderson. Those are the guys that like do you don't feel great about trading Zeke for them? C.J. Anderson, but- I don't feel <laughs> great about having my roster, let alone starting him. Well, I'm sure that we're going to talk about him during this episode. Uh, yeah. it, it is the start sit episode, so we'll, we'll be talking about him. And before we do jump into our rankings and talk start sit, I want to say congratulations to Nick of Minnesota who won the fathead.com gift card. Thank you to everyone who sent reviews. We read every single one of them and are extremely grateful for all the feedback and support. So thank you guys. Okay, so here's what we're going to do today. One position at a time, just like we usually do. One start of the week at each position. One sit of the week. And at the end, we'll hit on a few borderline players. Um, then we'll share a bold prediction at the end of the episode uh, for the week. Um, so let's start here at quarterback. And uh, we'll let you go first here, Pat. Who is your start of the week? Someone not so obvious, so like not Tom Brady or anything. Oh, this is definitely not obvious. How about Brett Hundley? Uh, Rue, oh, wow. man. I'm excited yeah, to hear this. Is a this. Packer. Hold on a second. This is a Packer homer. I got to hear this. That's right, Tags. It's Packers Bear Week, so you're going to get some of this, <laughs> all right? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, the passing has pretty much been disastrous since he's taken over. I think his uh, yards per attempt on the year is like 5.04, which is sub-replacement level, but it's a Konami code thing. Uh, the, you know, great... Running quarterback phrase, uh, coined by Rich Rebar, who, you know, believes strongly in the value of a running quarterback. And that's what it's been so far with Hundley. Even though the passing numbers have been awful, he's floated his value with a touch, a rushing touchdown in each of his two starts. Um, 66 rushing yards so far in those two games. And I think there's a ceiling for more. So, uh, you know, and one of these days, I think he might start feeling comfortable in the offense and actually be able to have some decent passing numbers to go along with those rushing numbers. So I think he's still pretty playable if you're in a jam this week due to the buys and, and injuries. It's not like he was horrible last week. A lot of people don't realize this because he just had 204, just 245 yards. Like we'd be pleased to have that some weeks. And he only got the one touchdown, but he was 26 for 38. He threw 38 passes. Just because he's not throwing downfield doesn't mean he's not going to pick up, you know, the 200 passing yards you need and and a touchdown here or there. I think Chicago's probably his easiest opponent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to be a game where, you know, they're going to have to pass. I don't think they're going to be able to just go run heavy against the Bears. The Bears have been too stout up front for that. So there's going to be some uh, passing if he can improve the efficiency just a little bit and not miss wide open receivers like he did on a couple of uh, pretty bad shots. I know a lot of people have been showing how uh, Jordy Nelson had no one like within 20 yards of him at one point and Hunley just completely missed him. So hopefully with uh, an increased comfort level in the offense, some uh, all the snaps he's been getting lately, Hunley starts to settle in a little bit. Yeah, he's got some good receivers, too, that could take one to the house. So uh, that could help out quite a bit. You know, he's ECR number 23. So that's probably the lowest I've ever heard on this start of the week section. I had him all the way up at 18. I was feeling pretty pumped about it. Like, man, this is going to be gold. Um, so I'm really excited to hear you say this, especially considering like you've been so accurate so far this season. Tags, where do you stand on Hunley here? Uh, I'm down on Hunley. I have him down at number 23. Uh, yes, he has the, the rushing totals have kind of peaked him a little bit, but it's it's he, he can only score so many rushing touchdowns so so many times. The the Bears defense has been a lot better than people think, and if you actually look at them at home over the last two years. 
they've been really dominant against quarterbacks. Like outside of Kirk Cousins, who it was like a week 16, week 17 game against them last year, uh, the Bears have allowed, I want to say it's fewer than 13 fantasy points per game to quarterbacks at home. And that's despite all the injuries they've had on the defense. So looking at Hunley and he couldn't get anything going against the Lions defense last week. I I don't know. I just, again, it's a road game. I just don't like him very much. I think there's better options. I would rather, honestly, if you want to go down the totem pole, I would rather play Eli Manning this week than, than Hunley. And I think Eli Manning can be considered as a streamer. Uh, I don't think he would be my start of the week because you never know which Eli you're going to get. But I would rather start Eli over Hunley. But my start of the week is Ben Roethlisberger. And, yeah, me um, too. And the thing is, is like, I know he's on the road and I know a lot of people are going to be concerned about that. And I'm usually one who's extremely concerned about it. But for whatever reason, in the inside of a dome, it doesn't seem to matter as much because uh, I went through and looked at it. And it, even last year, as early as last year, Ben Roethlisberger played on Thanksgiving Day in Indianapolis. He only threw 20 passes. But those 20 passes netted 221 yards and three touchdowns. Obviously, Martavis Bryant, he's getting him back into the lineup. Juju Smith-Schuster is stepping up. So he's got three really good weapons at wide receiver. And then he's got Le'Veon Bell in the backfield. The the Colts decided to not play their best cornerback. I I, I don't know what the Colts are doing. Uh, Avante Davis, they said it was a a coaching decision that that's the reason he he was out of the game. We don't know if he's going to play this week. On top of that, they lost their first round pick. They're starting for us free safety. So it's just this Colts defense is just so bad. The uh, Tom Savage ruined what was a perfect stat I was able to use every single week in the fact that the Colts have allowed every quarterback they've played to finish top 15 every week. But Tom Savage, of course, ruined that last week. So but we're not going to talk about Tom Savage. So Ben Roethlisberger, if you have them, get him in your lineup. You know, I want to go back to uh, to the Hunley call. I'm looking at the weather here in the Chicago game. It's going to be 41 degrees and likely raining. If that's the case, I want to consider using Hunley. If that's not the case, I think Pat made a pretty compelling case. Um, now, I said Big Ben was also my call. Uh, that's not true. I don't know why I said that. Um, his ECR <laughs> is, number, is number nine. Um, so I am starting uh, Ben Roethlisberger. I've got him number eight this week. But my call is actually Andy Dalton for the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, he's played just three matchups all season against past defenses that were outside the top quadrant in the NFL. He's got 16, 30, and 18 fantasy points in those contests. I think he's still the same steady QB1 that we've been seeing the past few years. His schedule's just been downright terrible. This week he gets the Titans, and they're not the easiest to pass against, but they're definitely not top quadrant. I think he's a top eight quarterback this week, even though his ECR is number 14. I like the call on Dalton. I have him at number 10, so uh, I'm definitely higher on him than the consensus as well. Uh, Tennessee, as I mentioned last week, you know, everybody t- asked about Alex Collins. Everybody was saying, you have to start Alex Collins. I'm like, no, you don't. Tennessee is really good against the run. The Bengals haven't been able to run the ball very much. Knowing that, that A.J. Green is going to be available for Andy Dalton this game, yeah. this is like an AJ Green blow up week. Like if you if you're playing DFS, you need to have AJ Green in your lineups. Not only is he like, you know, he's ticked off at the world and all this stuff, but he plays better on the road. Like if you look at his numbers for whatever reason, it's like the anti Ben Roethlisberger where AJ Green has dominated on the road and the Titans just don't have a good secondary. Like their cornerbacks are trash. Adoree Jackson, the rookie is going to try and handle AJ Green. Good luck. Um, but yeah, so if, if he's throwing a ton of yards to, to green, obviously you want the guy who's throwing him the ball. So I definitely dig Dalton this week as well. I think it's more likely that he's embarrassed Like going back and watching that tape. He has to be embarrassed. And even so, like he would want to turn around and, and show the world that like, man, I'm not this psychopath, but, um, yeah, I think, I think AJ green is going to have a good week. Oh, we're talking about AJ's rear naked chokehold of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was just ridiculous. I'm I'm shocked. Happy since he's on a couple of my teams, but shocked <laughs> that he was not suspended for that. Yeah. Um. So there's a few other guys here on uh, on the borderline. Josh McCown. A lot of people don't realize how well he's been playing lately. Top three in the NFL. He gets Tampa Bay this week. I think he's a pretty safe start. And I I feel weird saying that because it's Josh McCown, but he's been playing well lately. Um, another guy, Ryan Fitzpatrick, is right on the border there. His ECR is number 15 going up against the Jets. He is going to start in place of Jameis Winston, and he does have some weapons. Um, so what do you guys think about these two, Josh McCown and Ryan Fitzpatrick? Oh, uh, Fitzpatrick is going to be throwing YOLO balls all day. I mean, it hurts that Evans is going to be suspended. Um, but, you know, Adam Humphreys is a capable uh, fill-in target. Chris Godwin is going to get some extra snaps. Those guys aren't bad. Um, you know, he's been really erratic, or I should say 
The Bucs have been pretty erratic about finding Deshaun Jackson so far. Hopefully, though, with Fitz's downfield aggressiveness, uh, Jackson might come into play a little more. And, you know, he's got two good tight ends with Cameron Brait and O.J. Howard. So we'll see. But I think the thing you like about Fitzpatrick is that he is not shy about throwing downfield. And uh, you're probably going to have to live with an interception or two, I would expect, which is par for the course. But, um, you know, the aggression is a big positive there. Yeah, so for me, I, I do like Josh McCown this week. I think Josh McCown's one of the safest quarterbacks in fantasy this week. Um, going through his schedule, if you st- like starting in week two, he's had one game with fewer than 13.5 fantasy points, and that was against Jacksonville. Jacksonville hasn't allowed a top 18 quarterback this year. Like, I don't think we want to hold that against. We don't want to hold that against McCown. Uh, over the last three weeks, he's just thrown the he hasn't thrown the ball more than 33 times. Yet he's posted at least 16.9 fantasy points in each of those games. Him and Robbie Anderson are getting on the same page. The Bucks secondary is bad um, and they may be without Brent Grimes once again. Uh, it seems like that's the way it's trending. So I do like Josh McCown as a, a bottom end QB one. I think he's a safe play. As for Fitzpatrick, once I found out that Mike Evans wasn't going to play, uh, I kind of moved off of him because him and McCown were going to be in like that's They were going to be in like the same conversation, right? Like they were two guys that I felt like you could play as safe options. But N- Deshaun Jackson's not meant to be a number one receiver. Like he's not meant to see 10 targets a game. Uh, the Jets, are they going to be without Morris Claiborne? Because if they're going to be without Claiborne again, yeah, I'll bump up Fitzpatrick a little bit. I do think Humphreys is a solid play. Like if you're in a deep league and Adam Humphreys is out there and you just need a wide receiver to stick in your PPR lineup, I think Humphreys is a solid play. But yeah, Fitzpatrick is is more of that middling QB2 for me this week. So let's go sits of the week here. Maybe a guy that could bust who, you know, a lot of people are going to think is a QB1, but they're not. A few guys on my radar here, Marcus Mariota against Cincinnati. Kirk Cousins face Minnesota. Um, Pat, are you playing either of these two guys and who's your bust of the week? I'm not too excited about Cousins these days just because his offensive line is so decimated. You know, offensive line play is such a, an overlooked thing in fantasy at times. And, you know, even though Cousins played great last week against Seattle, just great, he still didn't put up the numbers. Um, I think that's going to continue to be a problem for him. He's not exactly working with the best wide receiver core in the league either. Um Oh, by the way, back to McCown for a second, guys. I know it's almost become a cliche every year that we say, oh, my God, this is the weirdest fantasy year ever. Like, such a bizarre year. Who could have ever seen these things happening? But here we are in week 10, and there are more startable New York Jets than Green Bay Packers this week. Yeah, (laughs) that's incredible. That's a great point. That's about as weird as it gets. So uh, my sit of the week, you guys aren't going to believe this, but it's Andy Dalton, your start of the week, and offensive line play works into that again. Um, you know, you talked about Fisher being out, and uh, Eric Winston, they just re-signed, 34 years old. Uh, I know he was a heck of an offensive lineman at the University of Miami like 12 or 13 years ago, but uh, pro- protecting Andy Dalton now, I'm not sure about that. Uh, they've had protection issues all year. It's just not a very crisp offense. Um, and the Tennessee defense is kind of sneaky underrated, I think. They're uh, two of the, the metrics I like to look at when gauging a uh, pass defense and kind of a quick and dirty approach, but yards per attempt and opponent passer rating, I think, are pretty important numbers. And Titans are only giving up 6.4 yards per attempt, which is, uh, you know, I think top third in the league. And uh, their opponent passer rating is 83.7, which ranks 11th. So. This is not a pushover pass defense, and considering that Dalton might not have all the time in the world to look for open receivers, I think it could be a disappointing day for him. Outside of the one week where they just got torched by Houston, um, Tennessee's defense really hasn't been that bad. Well, the thing is, if you look at the competition, this is where it comes down to for me. I I, I still think Tennessee is very bad. Like they're not getting to the passer. They are the uh, they're generating the second least pressure in the NFL in terms of a pass rush, which is going to help someone like Dalton because if he was going against a team like Jacksonville, yeah, like like they would bury him. I talked about it last week. Um, but if you look at what Tennessee's allowed, there have been three quarterbacks to finish his top eight quarterbacks, and that was Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson, and Derek Carr. The the all the other quarterbacks. Jacoby Brissett, Jay Cutler, Blake Bortles, Cody Kessler, Deshaun Kaiser. These are the quarterbacks that they've been playing. So like when you look at that, which group does Andy Dalton fit in? I would say it's closer to the Derek Carr group than it is, you know, the Cutler, the Bortles, the Kesslers. So for me, I like Dalton more than Derek Carr. 
I actually do too. I mean, I think they're similar in that way. I think they're both competent quarterbacks. You can get by with them. You can actually win a Super Bowl. I think they're competent enough to do that with. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, if Tennessee's not getting after the passer and they give him time, they don't have someone to cover AJ Green. Uh, and that's a real problem. Um, so that's why this will be interesting, obviously, with that being your sit of the week. My sit of the week is it's pretty easy. And I was waiting for you guys to just take it out from under me, but you didn't. So I'm going to take it. Um, Philip Rivers. Me too. You don't play. You, you don't play quarterbacks against Jacksonville. Like, honestly, if Tom Brady was playing against Jacksonville, he'd be ranked outside my top 12 quarterbacks just because it, it, they they legitimately. So think about it. We're heading into week 10 right now. They have not allowed a single quarterback to finish in the top 18 in any week. Like, that is some ridiculous stats right there. And they've played against Marcus Mariota, Jared Goff, Deshaun Watson, Ben Roethlisberger. So they've played against solid quarterbacks too, but nobody, nobody. And, and like looking at it even closer, the most fantasy points a player has scored against Jacksonville while throwing the ball, excluding their, their rushing totals was Marcus Mariota who scored it. It'd be 10.6 fantasy points with his arm. That's it. Uh, those are some really good numbers, man. I- I'm curious where you have Tom Brady here because he's going against Denver, who's probably the second best pass defense in the NFL. I've got him at number five. So, like, how much better are the Jags than Denver's defense? I mean, the Jags this year are they're the they're the 2017 version of the 2016 Broncos. So I want you to think about this for a second. Last year, the Denver Broncos the pass defense, there were just two games all season where they allowed more than one passing touchdown. Just two games. That's it. All right. This year, it has been, I want to say, six of the eight games they've played. They've allowed multiple passing touchdowns. This is not the same Denver defense. This is a defense that just allowed 51 points to the Eagles, who were without their best pass catcher, Zach Ertz. Like, they are not, like, I don't know. It just looked like a team that just didn't show up. Like, I I don't know if it was the, the traveling from Denver out to Philly, you know, that whole east to west thing. I don't know how that plays into it. And Tom Brady is obviously going out to Denver this week. It's a primetime game. We know we know Mr. Tom Brady shows up in primetime, so it's difficult for he me. He can go to the moon and throw three touchdown passes, man. <laughs> well, kind of, but he's also going to be missing Chris Hogan. But yeah. the area where he's going to exploit is Rob Gronkowski, right? Like the the Broncos cannot stop a tight end to save their life. Um, so Rob Gronkowski is going to have a hell of a game. So I have Brady at number four. I don't think Denver is nearly as scary as Jacksonville is. I'm not so worried about him missing Chris Hogan. I think he made Chris Hogan. Like Danny Amendola is the same player as well, – they're not the same player, but the same talent level as Chris Hogan. He'll be just fine. Brady will find guys to pass to. That's what he does. Well, Amendola is probably going to get wiped out by Chris Harris Jr. But yep. I mean, Chris Rex, yep. Rex Burkhead, James White, there's no shortage of targets there. So uh, I think Brady will be OK. I have him at uh, quarterback four. And, you know, Denver, Denver's a caution flag matchup. Jacksonville is a skull and crossbones matchup. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Uh, I've actually got Philip Rivers all the way down at number 23. So he was not even in consideration for starting. My guy's actually Jared Goff, his ECR. And by the way, if you're listening and you don't know what ECR means, it's our expert consensus ranking. So we've got like 110, 115 experts around the industry who all do their rankings and we compile them together to see what the expert industry thinks about each player. So Jared Goff is apparently the quarterback number seven this week. I have him quarterback number 13. Uh, I'm just looking at it. Houston's pass defense is not great. Uh, in fact, you could say it's easy to throw against this year, but I'm looking at 22 or fewer passes in two of the last three games for Goff, and it has me a little worried. I mean, we're relying entirely on that huge touchdown rate that only elite quarterbacks can hold, and I'm just not willing to put him in the same category as Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, and Drew Brees. I'm sorry. Well, Houston, the reason I think you should worry about uh, the reason that I'm, I'm I'm actually OK with putting golf. I think I've been is my QB eight this week. Uh, the reason I do is because Houston, ever since they've lost three members of their front seven, they have failed to generate a pass rush. They can't get after the quarterback and quarterbacks are sitting back and taking their time. Oddly enough, their run defense has been really good. So Todd Gurley's got a much tougher matchup than Jared Goff. They've only allowed three point three yards per carry this year. They've only allowed one rushing touchdown. And Bobby, that came all the way back in week one to Leonard Fournette. Um, so they haven't allowed a rushing touchdown in their last seven games, despite all these injuries. So Todd Gurley's got a stiffer matchup and, you know, this is a team that's returning home. The, the, the Rams are going to be at home against this defense. That's allowed three of the last four quarterbacks to score 21 or more fantasy points against them. So Jared Goff is just, I, I think the reason he's thrown so little is because he's been so efficient and I just, Houston doesn't have, they don't have the secondary to handle this. Yeah. On Goff, I, I have him quarterback seven this week. Uh, as tags mentioned, 
uh, Houston has sort of a pass funnel defense, tough against the run, weak against the pass. Um, so we might see the attempts tick up a little bit for Goff, and I think it's a pretty good situation with him taking the open receiver, whether it's, you know, Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, Sammy Watkins, even Tyler Higby. So uh, I feel pretty good about Goff for this week. Okay, guys, before we move over to running backs, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's show, SeatGeek. I've got the SeatGeek app on my phone, and it's by far the easiest way i found to shop for tickets. I can be anywhere, and with just a few taps, can instantly find tickets. SeatGeek saves you time and money by searching multiple ticket sites so you don't have to, to compare prices and find those amazing deals you're always looking for. Plus, every purchase is fully guaranteed by SeatGeek, so you can shop for tickets with confidence. Make SeatGeek your go-to app for finding the best deals on every type of ticket, from sports and concerts to comedy and theater. I use SeatGeek to get my hands on some tickets on the glass to a Blues game next week, and the Blues have been dominating lately, maybe the best team in the NHL this season, so I'm really excited. And best of all, our listeners get $20 off their first SeatGeek purchase. Just download the SeatGeek app and enter the promo code FANTASYPROS today. That's promo code FANTASYPROS, all one word, for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Download the app today. Okay, guys, now over to running back. I'm going to start us off here with our start of the week. Uh, I think with the way Jarek McKinnon's been playing for the Vikings and the bye, everyone's going to forget Latavius Murray sent at least 15 carries in each of the last three games. Here's some workhorses who haven't done that. Kareem Hunt, Melvin Gordon, LaShawn McCoy, DeMarco Murray, and believe it or not, Devontae Freeman hasn't done it once in the last three games. I just think Murray's a safe play. Uh, he's going to return value with at least 15 carries again. I'm a little worried about him, Bobby. It seems like Washington is, I don't know, their their run defense seems like it's solid. I don't know if this shapes up so much as a Murray game, as a McKinnon game. I could be wrong about that. What do you think, Tags? I'm actually with you, Pat, and the fact that like I I, I do believe that he's gonna gonna see like you know at least 12 carries, but that it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna net much. He just hasn't been a very explosive back. Like he's not one to break many 30 plus yard runs. Where Jarek McKinnon's like the kind of guy that can he could break off a, a big run. He's involved in the passing game, so you don't have to worry about him being game scripted out of it. I don't think that Murray is like a terrible play. I think that he's just more of like a touchdown reliant RB three, whereas McKinnon. He's like an all-purpose back. Like I have McKinnon this week sitting out just outside my top twelve running backs. He's Me at too. Number thirteen. Uh, so I mean, if I, I just don't, I don't see the Redskins allowing two like top twenty running backs, which is why uh, I have Latavius Murray down at thirty four right now. He might move up a little bit from there, but that's that's right around where I kind of feel like I have him, like in that RB three range. Yeah, I, I've got McKinnon number fifteen, so I like him quite a bit more. I just think you know with 12, 15, maybe eighteen carries. I think he's a better start than someone like uh, like a Thomas Rawls at Arizona or Deion Lewis at Denver, C.J. Anderson against anyone. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's why I've got him in there. I've got Latavius Murray at number 27 as a, a solid flex play this week. I, the whole C.J. Anderson thing, I don't know. I know you have this thing against C.J. Anderson right now, and I, I understand it to an extent because it's it's a ma- – He's playing like a third of the game, He's man. not playing bad, though. That's the thing. It's been the coaching that's been terrible. So with them returning home – He's not getting any goal line carries. We're talking like he's going to get eight carries. No. And he, yeah, he might get 40 yards, but he's not getting goal line carries. No, hold on a second. We don't know that he's not going to get goal line carries. They just haven't been on the goal line <laughs> to get the carries. Like he, <laughs> Well, they, the last time they were, they gave it to Booker. Well, I think it had to do with C.J. Anderson's injury. I think that's what it came down to, is that he was he was semi-hurting right then and there. Now, but that's the thing. So this all comes down to me having se- some of the faith in the coaching staff. Okay, I'm having faith that they're returning home after like one of the most embarrassing losses in franchise history. And they're about to play the Patriots and they're like double digit underdogs, which is ridiculous for the Broncos at home. Something that should never, ever happen. What do you do if you want to keep Tom Brady off the field? Do you throw it Brock Osweiler over and over? No, you run the ball an awful lot. And the Patriots just lost uh, Dante Hightower for the year. They lost Shane McClellan, which hurts their pass rush. But this let's be real about this. They need to run the football. CJ Anderson is their starter. Yes, it's somewhat of a timeshare. I just think there's enough carries to go around against a Patriots defense that's allowing 
over five yards per carry. I think CJ Anderson is a Patriots defense that hasn't given up more than 17 points over the last four weeks. They've been crushing people. That's not true. Melvin Gordon. I think he scored 17 points. I'm talking 17 points to any team, not running back. Oh, like, oh, points. Oh, well, I mean, even if they score 17, CJ Anderson's involved in that. Um, But that's again, that that high tower with you. You think you think that because no one has scored over 17, that all of a sudden Denver is going to score around 17. Denver is the worst offense in the NFL right now. They don't have the worst offense in the NFL, but it's not it's not great. I'm not going to say that, but I think the Patriots are that bad where I have faith in CJ Anderson. I would play CJ Anderson this week over Adrian Peterson. What? Ooh. <laughs> okay, okay. Pat, you can be the tiebreaker here. Well, what's your what's your take on these guys? All right, so I have Anderson like ranked above the ECR, I believe. I have him at running back twenty three. So I'm more optimistic on him than most. But uh, I think I've got Peterson just outside my top ten. So I'm I'm definitely liking Peterson more. Wow, yeah, I've like- got Peterson fourteen. Talk to me about this, guys. What do you guys like about Peterson this week? Uh, he's getting 30 plus carries every game. Yeah, so I, <laughs> like, I know he's not going to get 37 carries again on three days rest, basically. But, you know, they have got to run the ball. They're not going to play into the teeth of that Seattle defense by just passing it with Drew Stanton. They have to establish that run. And I, th- I think they're happy to just, you know, wear Adrian Peterson out. This is Bruce Arians' last ride. Peterson is not their back of the future, obviously, with David Johnson eventually back. Uh, you know, if they can keep the game flow close, and I think they can, because who does Seattle really put away these days? Um, if they can keep the game flow close, I think he gets 20 carries at least. And, you know, Seattle's run defense is decent. I don't think it's dominant. But um, yeah, I, I think just based on the volume and, and you know, with four teams on by, uh, I, I think he's pretty much a must start. Have you guys ever have you guys ever listened to the Joe Rogan podcast that he, the one he had Arian Foster on? Did you ever hear that one? I didn't hear that one, but yeah, I, I do like him. He's solid. Okay. So yeah. So go back. It, it's like, it was like two years ago where he interviewed Arian Foster, like right when he was retiring from the NFL. Um, and I think he came back to the Dolphins after that, but it was right around that time. And uh, he talked about when you're a running back and you, you total more than like 25 carries in a game. He's like, I'm not kidding. And he walked us, he walked you through the cycle and how your body moves and how much you ache and how you can barely walk. He's like, by the time you get to Wednesday and he's like, and if you're a running back on Thursday playing, he's like, forget about it. Like seriously downgrade that player on, on Thursday because you don't have the proper time to let your body heal. We're talking about a 32 year old running back that just saw 39 touches. That's the most of his career. Well, hold on a second. He's a robot. Arian Foster's body's made out of <laughs> lettuce and carrots. <laughs> He's a robot. <laughs> I have no argument against that. I mean, but no, but for real though, do you think that the Arizona Cardinals are going to hang with the, with the Seattle Seahawks for very long in this game? Like, do you think it's going to be a competitive game throughout? Because then, yeah, you can convince me that Adrian Peterson's going to see 20 carries. I don't see that happening. I, I, I see Russell Wilson in the passing game working really well. The Seahawks don't really have that, that alpha dog at wide receiver that the Cardinals can just stick Patrick Peterson on. Doug Baldwin plays a slot. They they tri- this would be very unconventional for them to stick Patrick Peterson on a slot receiver. They just don't do that. So looking at this, Tyron Matthew against Doug Baldwin in the slot, it's just there's there's a lot of question marks about this matchup. And again, I'm just worried about the same thing that happened. Are you benching Peterson? I have him. Okay, I'm, is he outside your top 24? No, he's I have him at 20 right now. Um, he's, okay. so he's not outside my top 24. I'd start him over guys like Amir Abdullah, like Aaron Jones, where there's question marks about these guys. But I, I'm just saying, it kind of reminds me uh, like of last week where it was Alex Collins, where everybody wanted to play Alex Collins, and I was just like, no, no, just calm down. See, Alex Collins played like 30 percent of the snaps last week. I don't know well, what's going I, on there. That's here's my question though, Bobby. Did the Cardinals know? Know that this was happening this week did they did they give Peterson 39 touches because they knew they were going to be playing the Seahawks this week and they were going to have to use Andre Ellington more Andre Ellington only played 14 snaps last week he was practicing it makes zero sense so for me I think it may have been preparing for this week knowing they're playing the Seahawks and that they're going to have to use Ellington a little bit more I just don't see Peterson cracking that 20 carry marks. I just don't think that the Cardinals can keep this game competitive for that long. I didn't think Washington was going to keep it competitive with Seattle and got me knocked out of a survivor pool tag. So uh, that's very true. Like this, <laughs> this is not the Seattle of three years ago. I would not make assumptions about game flow with these guys because I don't think they can put teams away like they used to be able to. Yeah, it's, I agree. Well, it's also not the Arizona defense that we've always known. Like this Arizona true. defense has been pathetic. That's the, that's my concern for me. And Seattle's run defense, they kind of have got it together. They've struggled against. The 
the pass, believe it or not, as of late. That's like the weakness of their team right now. They're top five against the run right now. Yeah, they're, they they turned it around. Earlier in the year, they allowed a couple big runs to Carlos Hyde and DeMarco Murray, which kind of skewed the numbers. But um, they've righted the ship over the last few weeks. But again, the pass defense is what's been struggling. And I just don't think that the Cardinals have the players to take advantage of that. So, I mean, if this I mean, if they are able to shut down the Seahawks offense and they, this game is like a seven to like 10, seven game. Yeah, sure. Um, I just don't see any way that it, it remains that competitive throughout. We'll see. Um, Pat, who's your uh, who's your start of the week at running back? It's Bilal Powell. Um, I know. Ooh, interesting. I know a lot of rankers are probably going to have more daylight between Matt Forte and Powell than I have this week. And I've got them adjacent to each other at 19 and 20. Um, I think a game against the Buccaneers can support two startable running backs just because, you know, it's been start come one, come all against the Buccaneers defense, which is what, 28th in the league in total yards allowed. Um, you know, Forte had the nice game last week and got the majority of snaps, but he was still right around 50%. And I don't think it goes any higher than that. I think Elijah McGuire in what turned out to be kind of a blowout got more snaps than we're going to see him generally get. So I think there's room for both Forte and Powell. They both run and catch. So I think they're both pretty game proof, uh, game script proof. And, you know, neither one of them can be knocked out of the game depending on a, a score. You know, I, I think they're both playable this week. And uh, people are going to write off Powell just because of Forte's big game last week. But I think that would be a mistake. He's so much better than people give him credit for. Every single time he gets touches, he delivers. And he almost had 100 yards last week, if not for a holding penalty that wiped out a second long run. And I know it was mostly just on the two long runs and he was kind of getting bottled up otherwise. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's that's what he does, though. I mean, that's that's how you get yards. True. Uh, it's it's weird because the the Jets have finally done what they should have did with Matt Forte once they got him. They were treating Matt Forte as their one two down back. And then they were bringing in Bilal Powell is kind of like a change of pace running back and gave him a couple carries on first second down. They had these roles mixed up. Bilal Powell should have been carrying the ball in first and second down. Matt Forte is the third down back. He's one of the best receivers in all of football. Matt Forte is phenomenal out of the backfield. He love him. He, he's a decent blocker, um, but they, they they've started to use him more out of the backfield catching passes as of late, um, which is really something that you have to like um, Tampa Bay. They have struggled, and that's I like how Pat mentioned it I, in my in the primer that I'm writing up right now. I said that the opponents against the Bucks have been able to total at least 25 carries. Uh, as a team in five of the last seven games. So I think that there's plenty of carries to go around here between Forte and Powell that they both can be used. I have them both inside my top 32. Uh, I do have Forte a little bit higher. I, I do. I have no issue with that call. I think, I think Powell is the guy who probably should get more touches, but for whatever reason, no coach has ever wanted to give Bilal Powell like the workhorse role. And I don't, I don't understand it because he's produced but maybe he's just not meant for that role. I have no idea. He has a lot more, you know, zero, one, two yard runs than most running backs in the NFL. So I'm sure they get sick of that. But, you know, he, he busts them out for 20, 30, 40 yards here and there. Yeah, their defense has been playing a lot better than <laughs> than I think anybody expected them to this year, which has allowed them to kind of rack up those carries, which is allowing Matt Forte and Bilal Powell to remain fantasy relevant. So, um yeah, Bobby, who's your who's your start of the week? Oh, I already gave it. It was Latavius Murray. Oh, that's right. Your guy. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so mine this week, it, I mean, I don't want to go back to CJ Anderson. I don't need to talk about that anymore. <laughs> um, but mine would probably be Damian Williams. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people after the week that he just had. They're going to be they're going to be wanting to put Drake higher in their rankings. And I'm I'm one of the people that believes that Drake down the road is going to be the guy like he's going to be the guy that you want to own but this particular Not against week, Carolina right this particular week I think this is a Damian Williams week because Carolina just their their lights out against the run but they have I mean they've only allowed 3.58 yards per carry three touchdowns on the season they've yet to allow running back more than 71 yards on the ground there was a reason that I didn't like Devonta Freeman so much last week but there have been six running backs who have totaled more than 30 yards receiving against them the most of the th of the Three of the most successful running backs against them this year have been Alvin Kamara, James White, and Theo Riddick, three guys who are used very heavily in the pass game. So I do consider Damian Williams as a, a strong RB3 this week, and you could consider him like a low-end RB2 in PPR formats. Yeah, I, I could see that. He's a little bit deeper down for me, but um, I, I don't know. We've just seen one week. He did get six receptions, but I'm not so sure he's going to get six receptions every time. So 
Yeah, I don't think it's going to be every week, and that's why I'm saying going forward, I, I still would much rather own Kenyon Drake, but not this week. Uh, so I have Damian Williams at uh, right in that 26 uh, this week, whereas Drake is down at like 37. So uh, I'm not really wanting to play Drake if I can help it, but uh, Damian Williams is definitely a start. All right, guys, running back bust. My guy, I'll start us off again. Aaron Jones played 31% of the snaps last week. 31% of the snaps. That's less than J.D. McKissick, Peyton Barber, Elijah McGuire. 31, guys. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Pat on this one because he's the Packer guy. Um, so he can probably yeah. tell you. He, 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 the thing is, I always appreciate talking to people who follow a team very closely. Like if somebody asked me about the Bears, I can give an honest take. You know, our job is to analyze the game, not necessarily have fandom. So uh, what do you think it is going forward, Pat? Like, do you think that Aaron Jones, it was just one game that we shouldn't overthink it? Or do you think that there's a real possibility that Aaron Jones lost his job? Well, obviously, game flow kind of got away from the Packers and a, you know, um, when they're playing from behind, it's going to favor Montgomery. Who knows what it's going to be like in a Mitch Trubisky versus Brett Hundley game and what game flow is going to be there. But even if game flow does stay manageable enough for the Packers to stick with the run a little bit more, Brian Bulaga, torn ACL, they're starting right tackle, done for the season. Martellus Bennett still has the shoulder injury, great run blocker. Who knows what his status is for this week. So if those two guys are out, I mean, that's really going to hurt the Packers' ability to run the ball. So I think that's kind of reason for uh, pause on Aaron Jones anyway. I've got him like running back 24. You know, I think he's going to get 10 or more carries this week, but who knows what he's going to be able to do with them behind sort of a, a depleted uh, front as far as run blocking goes. That's fair. That's fair. Um, so my... So Aaron Jones, I mean, that that one can be. I think this is the week we're going to find out the answer to your question, though, Bobby, is because I, I think the game against the Bears should be relatively competitive throughout. And in a I've been a Montgomery guy all along thinking as soon as his ribs are recovered, he's the guy. I don't think that that's the thing is I think some people are quick to to jump and say that Montgomery is going to steal that job back. But Montgomery was really bad in the starting role. Like he wasn't good. Their he was offensive good. line was so much more banged up than when Aaron Jones was going. But that's the thing is it's still banged up. They, that, they, I don't know. If well, they, now it's banged up again. But when when Aaron Jones started dominating, that's when their offensive line was actually healthy. For I don't once. know if they've ever had all five offensive linemen healthy for a game this season. Like the, the, the offensive line just been it's been brutal. Like they've been playing injured. Uh, Bakhtiari, uh, the left tackle, he's been playing hurt through a lot of the year he's missed a lot of games um, but again Ty Montgomery wasn't breaking tackles he just really wasn't working out in that role whereas Aaron Jones has one bad game again I thought this was going to be come back to a timeshare it was a it was a something that I said Aaron Jones was a sell all along but I'm also not going to write him off after one game but my sit of the week it, it would have been Adrian Peterson but I'm going to go somewhere else now just because we've already talked about Peterson Amir Abdullah is my sit of the week here. If you've had a chance to kind of take a look, like a lot of people see the Browns on the schedule and they think, oh my God, I have to play this running back. They're playing the Browns. I mean, who doesn't do well against the Browns? There's a lot of running backs that don't do well against the Browns. They've allowed uh, just 2.91 yards per carry on the season, three touchdowns on the season. They're allowing more work through the, the passing game, which is Amir Abdullah. He's kind of secondary to Theo Riddick. This is a game for the passing game to kind of post, you know, Gaga numbers. Uh, Marvin Jones is basically, I, I have him ranked as a wide receiver one this week. I'm having a hard time keeping Golden Tate out of my top 20 as well. So uh, Amir Abdullah, he has struggled. If you watch the game uh, on primetime, you know why Amir Abdullah struggled because that offensive line is just, it's brutal. So knowing that the Browns stopped the run extremely well, Amir Abdullah is going to be a bust this week. Plus he fumbled twice, once on the red zone. So you can bet he's not getting a goal line carry again. Um, that was a real bummer. And man, Marvin Jones just killed me. Like every single fantasy league I went up against Marvin Jones. I was like, why are you starting this guy? He just whooped me. Well, a fun story. I had uh, in one of my leagues, I had Aaron Jones left and my opponent had Marvin. I was up going into that game by 15 points. I felt pretty good about it. Oh, I did not man. Win. <laughs> that sucks so bad. <laughs> Pat, what do you think about Abdullah this week, and who's your sit of the week? Totally with tags on that. He's out of my top 25. Um, the Lions can't run block. Browns are great against the the run, not so good against the pass. So I think Detroit's going to attack him through the air. Um, you know, I think it's more of a Riddick week than an Abdullah week. My sit of the week is Orleans Darqua. So a lot of people are going to look at this matchup against the 49ers and think it's a plum matchup for Darqua. But I'd be kind of cautious about that. Yes, the 49ers are dead last in the league against the run, but that's through quantity more than quality. 
They're only giving up like 3.9 yards per carry. The problem is they've opponents have run the ball 314 times. And I, yeah. I think the next highest number of rushing attempts against any defense is 272. So that's 42 more attempts against the 49ers than any other team. It's not so much, and which is obviously a game flow thing because the Niners are 0 and 9, but the Giants stink. I mean, the Giants stink and they're on the road. <laughs> so I think the 49ers are going to be in this game and that's, you know, not going to allow the, the Giants to just pound it away 30, 35 times on the 49ers. And, you know, Dark was okay. Uh, as every TV analyst who calls Giants game says, he takes what you give him and he just, you know, runs, runs where the play is meant to go and everything. But he's not really useful in the passing game. Uh, he hasn't shown a real TD proclivity yet. And I still have this nagging feeling that Wayne Gallman is going to get more involved in that backfield as the year goes on. So, yeah, I'm just uh, not feeling it for Dark One. I'm just kind of uh, fading him basically every week here. All right, guys, wide receiver. And uh, Pat, we'll let you go first here. Who's your start of the week at wide receiver? All right, so it's Jermaine Curse. Um you know, take advantage of this Buccaneers defense. I know Robbie Anderson is the sexier of the two Jets receivers right now, but uh, Curse is still involved, get, getting his five or six targets every week. If uh, that number could get bumped up just a little bit more, I think there's the potential for a really good game against this, uh, you know, 49ers, or excuse me, Buccaneers pass defense that's just getting blowtorched every week. Yeah, Kerr started off the season really well. I'm looking at his last few games and he hasn't done anything. But then again, it is the Buccaneers. So I do have Curse as right on the fringe of being startable in the flex. Uh, I'm not super excited about him. But like you said, I mean, you can't always play the sexiest player. Yeah, I mean, Anderson is a, I don't know where you guys have Anderson. I think he's like number 15 for me. Um, but as far as a guy who people might, yeah, people might not normally consider Curse. But I think this is not a bad week to roll him out if you're depleted due to injuries and and buys yeah tags who's your guy here oh uh, i mean i think there's a lot i've had a lot of people asking me about it so that's why i'm i'm using him as my start of the week and that's Ster- sterling shepherd i don't know why people are even considering this a question sterling shepherd in his first game back saw eight targets which is kind of like the minimum he's going to see going forward and going against the 49ers who were already a bad secondary uh they traded away richard robinson at the trade deadline uh to the jets this secondary just has zero answers. Kawan Williams has missed the last couple of weeks. They don't know if he's going to be able to go this week, but if he does return to the lineup, it's going to be after a multi-week absence. You always want to attack those players. There have been eight wide receivers who have already posted top 24 numbers against the 49ers. And again, if, if Williams is out with that quad injury that he's been dealing with, that's going to be even a larger bump, even if he returns. Again, I'm not really worried about it. So Shepard, I actually have him right now as my number 12 receiver this week. Yeah, I've got him all the way up at 15. I like Shepard a lot too. I'm super high on him. I think the ECR was like a 20 something, uh, 20. Uh, so I, again, I'm higher on him than most. Uh, but I just, looking at wide receivers, like once you get outside like the top nine receivers, you can make a case for a lot of those guys to move up in your rankings. And I just feel the most confident about Shepard because you know he's going to see eight targets. Like it's it. There is nowhere else he can go. Roger Lewis isn't going to get it done. King isn't going to get it done. Evan Ingram, sure, he's going to be fine. But again, Shepard, love him. The, the problem is, Tags, they're Eli Manning targets. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Against the Giants uh, or against the 49ers, though, I, uh, I'll take not in most matchups. I would not trust uh, to put a wide receiver that high. But knowing it's the, for, uh, the 49ers who have struggled basically against everyone. That's why I feel yeah. OK. With I mean, I, I like him, too. Generally, I've got him wide receiver 20 and it's mainly because of Eli Manning and uh, Ben McAdoo. You know, I just can't put him any higher than that. Yeah, it's fair. So my start of the week. Look, I don't like Will Fuller, mostly because he just makes math seem stupid, and math is not stupid. But even without Deshaun Watson, I think he's good enough that you have to start him. He saw eight targets last week, and it's eight targets. He could take any one of these to the house. So I think he's light years ahead of these other guys who are on the fringe right now. What is it? Uh, Will Fuller's ECR number 39. I, I've got him in my top 30. Wow. I have Fuller down at 44. Um, I'm I'm off him. Like, it, like we, we already knew regression was coming, right? And you, you mentioned it. Tom Savage is not very good at football. But regression uh, from top 10 to 45? Well, he was never top 10 for me. 
He was never going to be top 10. I'm saying he performed like top 10. He performed like top 10. So if he's regressing, he's going back towards 30. With Deshaun Watson, with, with Deshaun Watson, yeah, I would have said regression to like the top 36. But Tom okay. Savage legitimately has thrown one touchdown pass in his career. Like what makes us think that he's going to throw multiple ones against a Rams team? Do you know, did you know the Rams have only allowed three wide receivers Three wide receivers all year to finish as top 36 options. Really? That's ridiculous. Yes. Like it's, it's, it, it's ridiculous. It's the second lowest in the league behind Jacksonville. Um, so legitimately the Rams are better than you think. It's because they're so bad against the run. <laughs> like the Rams against the run are just terrible. Uh, Will Fuller, again, I don't think that he's like the worst talent. I don't think he's like, he, he belongs down at number 44. I just have zero belief in Tom Savage against the Rams defense where honestly the Rams should be able to get after Tom Savage and make him feel uneasy. Uh, so again, I mean, if you're going to rank DeAndre Hopkins as a top 15 option, which I think you kind of have to, do we think that Tom Savage can support two top 36 wide receivers against a defense that's only allowed three all year? My answer to that would be no. Let me ask you this, Tags. Who's more talented at this point in their careers, Will Fuller or Deshaun Jackson? Deshaun Jackson still. Are you serious? You really think so? Yeah. Yeah. Deshaun Jackson is so he's underrated. Like he's like, I don't think he's an alpha receiver, but I think he's so underrated. Like if you put Deshaun Jackson in one-on-one coverage and you do not shade a safety over his way, he's going to beat you every single time. And Will Fuller, you can't say that about. Pat, Pat, are you starting Will Fuller this week? I've got him wide receiver 39. I'm, I'm a little worried about him. He has been a really hard guy to rank all year though. So like, I've never felt confident that I'm making the right call on him in any given week. And you know, uh, I agree with what Bobby said about how he can just make his daily quota with one play. That's the thing you like about him. Kind of like Mike Wallace in the, in the sure. yeah. past. Like he's the guy that you never know how to rank. He's always right. 30 right. to 40. And right. One week he's going to be top five yeah. and the next week he's going to be top yeah. 60. So you, you got to like that home run potential. But, you know, the, the Tom Savage thing is going to be a problem. And against a pretty good pass defense, you know, he, he could definitely get skunked. All right. Bust of the week. Who's your guy, Pat? All right. So it's all relative. I still got this guy just inside my top 25, but I'm really nervous about Devontae Parker this week. Um, You know, he came back and had a pretty solid game against the Raiders last week, but I just do not. uh, I foresee doom and gloom for the Dolphins offense going to Carolina. I just think that is going to be a really tough game. What are the chances that Jay Cutler puts two good games together in a row? I know Cutler likes to, at least, you know, it's been the narrative since the preseason that he likes to to challenge defenses downfield with Parker, but Cutler's also been going to uh, Jarvis Landry quite a bit. Um, I just think there are a lot of possible ways for Parker to not meet expectations this week. I think it's a fair concern. I, li- I like Parker as a wide receiver, too, for the, re- the rest Me of the too. season. But I do think it's a fair concern this week against Carolina because Carolina brings the second best pass rush in the NFL behind only the Jaguars. And if you pressure Jay Cutler, he's going to he's going to become bad Jay. And like I've seen it all too often in Chicago, like with Jay, if you give him time, he's going to he's going to be fine. Uh, Jay has actually been really good for the last three games for the Dolphins. I was looking at that earlier and Jay's been playing a lot better as the year has gone on. Uh, But this offensive line is not great. The Panthers are going to pressure him. And for whatever reason, Jay Cutler, some people have talked about diabetes and how it affects people differently at night where it's like their sugar levels could be off and it can affect affect their vision but Jay Cutler has always been bad on primetime like he's always been bad playing night games for whatever reason uh so like like I said I don't know if there's anything to that I'm not a doctor I'm not gonna pretend that I am but it's it's noteworthy and so Parker I feel like he's the the type of guy like he's talented enough to beat coverage against Carolina James Bradbury has been he was good his rookie year. He, he slowed down a little bit in, in his sophomore season. We saw Julio Jones beat that team in coverage so much last week. Um, it should have been a massive game for Julio Jones had he not dropped that touchdown. Uh, but Devontae Parker, I still think I still feel like he's a wide receiver, too, because there's really no one else. Jarvis Landry did see his targets drop last week with Parker back in the lineup. Kenny Stills doesn't see very many targets when Parker's there uh, in four games that Devontae Parker has played this year. Uh, like the full game. He's totaled at least, uh, I want to say 70 yards in every game. So he is getting the targets. He's talented, which is why I can't fully fade him. But I, I do understand where Pat's coming from here with, with Cutler being blitzed and, and pressured yeah. and at night, all those things. Uh, yeah. So who are you fading this week, Tags? Uh, there's quite a few players that I, I'm fading and I'm looking at, uh, looking at the ECR. I have no idea how people are playing Juju Smith-Schuster as a wide receiver too in fantasy. I don't get it. Um, like I like Juju the player, I, but I, I have no idea how people are doing that. 
But Kelvin Benjamin is my sit of the week where I don't I, I, I honestly would prefer not to play him at all this week against uh, the, the Saints. The, the people have this notion about the Saints defense that, oh, players are just going to go off against the Saints. But that doesn't happen anymore, guys. The Saints have been so good. Uh, and it, this is going to be his first game in a new offense. We know that receivers going to a new team struggle in their first year, let alone their first game. And he's going against potential rookie of the year, Marshawn Lattimore. Marshawn Lattimore has been so good. He got in the head of Mike He's Evans. He's awesome. Yeah, he is so good. Uh, and Kelvin Benjamin is not the type of wide receiver to break coverage and, and get multiple yards of separation. He relies on jump balls. He relies on, you know, out, out like just basically boxing out his defender. The problem is, this goes back to the trade where, you know, Bobby and you and I talked about this last week in that we sh- we were selling Kelvin Benjamin. I am because Tyrod Taylor is not the type of quarterback to take risks. He's got 14 interceptions over the last three years combined. Uh, he just doesn't throw the ball into tight coverage like Cam Newton did, which means Kelvin Benjamin is not going to see a steady stream of targets. So against Lattimore, I-, I want no part of Benjamin. My bust is uh, Cooper Cup. He's gone over 60 yards once all season. So if you want three or four points this week, I mean, he, he's your guy, but that's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> I'd rather have Marquise Goodwin or even Adam Humphreys, who we talked about earlier without Mike Evans and Tampa's lineup. Yeah. Cubs matchup versus Houston. I mean, it's not a bad, it's not like the worst matchup in the world. He probably has the toughest matchup of the wide receivers uh, in the slot. Whereas Sammy Watkins, hey, real quick. I almost said Sammy you know, Watkins an unbiased, here. I almost uh, on, said I'd bench Sammy an Watkins. Un- <laughs> an unbiased opinion, Pat. How do you feel about Sammy Watkins this week? I think this might be one of the last pretty good weeks for him. Like this is where you don't have to worry about a shutdown corner on him. He's got a bunch of those coming up. So I feel pretty good about him. Yet there's enough of a equal dispersion of passes. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't have him in wide receiver two territory, but he's pretty solidly in wide receiver three territory for me. Over under for Sammy Watkins this week, 2.5 targets. <laughs> <laughs> Over. <laughs> Tags, can we go back to Juju for a second? What you don't think he's uh, wide receiver two this week? I've actually got him wide receiver thirteen. Ooh! Oh wow! I gotta. Well, the the thing is, do you is- guys really think that Martavis Bryant is going to come back and have a significant role? Like knowing what I know about Mike Tomlin, I think like Martavis Bryant is going to play like a dozen snaps. That would be the over under for me. A dozen snaps on Martavis this week. Okay. Now I'm. I'm of the mindset where it's like these two, it's like two people that didn't like each other that wanted to break up. And there was a law that basically kept them together. And and going forward, they know that they're kind of stuck together. So they have to make it work. So Tomlin's got to give a little bit. And this may have come down from the top. You know, Ben Roethlisberger said even before last week, he said, we have to get Mark Davis involved in this offense. And I, I think they truly mean that. And I think it's what's going to to get this this offense rolling uh, because they haven't really performed to this point. Like Ben Roethlisberger hasn't been great. He's been out of touch with with Martavis Bryant. It's just like they're not in sync. Uh, this game is on a track, <laughs> basically, in Indianapolis where Martavis Bryant, if they're going to get him involved, this is the perfect time to do it. Uh, by the way, news broke during our show just now where Vontae Davis is going to be out again this week. This is a defense you, you legitimately target. Um, but the thing is, the, who's been playing best for them is Nate Hairston, their slot cornerback. He's been playing competently out of the slot. He's only allowing a 53% catch rate in coverage. And again, Juju, that's where he's kind of been been stuck to is the slot. Ben Roethlisberger, he's going to get uh, Antonio Brown plenty of points this game. Le'Veon Bell is going to see plenty of garbage time. I just don't see Juju getting any more than five targets in this game. And when you're seeing that few targets, granted, he can turn him into something, which is why I haven't moved him out of my, my startable area. I just... I think he goes back to that number three option in the passing game, maybe even number four, if they really, truly do mean that they want to get Martavis Bryant on the field. Because I think them getting Martavis Bryant going benefits everybody, right? It stretches the field. It it, sh- it shades coverage away from Antonio Brown. Juju's going to get everything underneath. Le'Veon Bell's going to get everything else. It's just this offense almost needs Martavis Bryant with the way they've been playing right now. Okay, guys, let's talk uh, tight ends here. And uh, we're just going to go either one start or one sit. I don't have a sit play this week. Just play the chalk. Don't stray from it. I think the drop off from number 12 to number 13 is significant this week from Tyler Croft to Austin Hooper at Dallas. Um, so my start of the week, and it kind of makes me a little sick to my stomach, but Garrett Selleck should be, uh, he should yeah. get a handful of receptions. George Kittle's out. Rookie quarterbacks pass to tight ends a lot. Uh, plus, they just lost Pierre Garcon for the season. So, Garrett Selleck, it is. I've got him tied at number 14. So, I think he's someone you can stream if you need to. I don't want to, but some people need a tight end, and I think he's the guy. 
All right, I'll tout a guy just picked up in the Chicago Media League that I compete with tags in, or uh, not so much compete because <laughs> I'm kind of a welcome mat in that league this year, but uh, I just had to pick up David Njoku. Targets have been ticking up slightly for him recently, and he gets a pretty good matchup against Detroit this week. Kid's a playmaker. Monster. I think he's got enough, yeah, he's got enough games under his belt where I think we can maybe start to see... Um, a little more involvement from him and, uh, you know, they're going to be, he's, he's got a bright future and, uh, maybe he starts realizing it now. What do you guys think about Eric Ebron against Cleveland this week? Yeah, he's on the border. He's on the border tight end one radar, man. I'm not even kidding. And I don't want to say that Isn't about that nuts. It, it really is because he's been I, I mean, r- the rumor has it is that there were teams shopping, uh, trying to pull Ebron from the Lions and that they refused to give him up at the trade deadline. Huh. Uh, if there's truth to that. Uh, if there's truth to that, they do have plans for the kid. And I mean, we have to remember, he's only 24 years old. Like tight ends don't break out at 23 unless you're Evan Ingram um, or Rob Gronkowski. But outside of those guys, like tight ends just don't break out before the age of 25, 26. So I think there's still room for Ebron. But against the Browns, I mean, I think you have to consider anyone uh, in that tight end one territory. Okay. And Ebron looked really good against the Packers, who have not given up much to tight ends all year. And this is the, the Browns. Best. Yeah. And the Browns have been terrible. So, okay, Tag, so you picking a start of the week or sit of the week? Then we'll each do one bold prediction. Honestly, I want to go back to Garrett Selleck um, and talk about him just because, like, <laughs> in my primer, I'm talking about, I said, just let's see how far we can push this whole start, whichever tight end plays yes. the Giants, because <laughs> every so every single week this year, every single game, they have allowed a top 12 tight end in standard leagues. It was top 12 in standard and PPR coming into this last week. But Tyler Higby catching one pass for a touchdown didn't finish top 12 in PPR, but he did in standard. So that's every single week. The 49ers have only tar- started uh, like they've only ever since uh, Beathard took over. They've only targeted their tight end more than five times uh, in just once, I, I want to say. And none of them, none of them have done anything right. But in this game, we have to consider Selleck getting a lot of targets because not only is Garcon out for the year, but Kittle, he's obviously not playing. And Trent Taylor is out. Trent Taylor has been getting six to eight targets over the middle field, the field in the slot. Big this Carlos Hyde game line, for me, man. I love Carlos Hyde this week. Well, yeah. Do, hold on. Fun fact. Did you know that there's only two running backs in the entire NFL with more receptions than Carlos oh, Hyde? Man, he has more no. receptions. You know, he has more receptions than LaShawn McCoy and Le'Veon Bell. That's a great stat. That's incredible. Wow. No, it's nuts. I, I, I couldn't believe it when looking through it because he's been catching a lot. But it, that's basically what I'm saying is opening up so much underneath. I think Garrett Selleck, I love that call, actually. OK, let's go on over to bold predictions. And Pat, you can go first. Tags, this one is for you since it is Bears Packers week. You know, the Packers finally took the lead in the all time series, which was just decades in the making. I know when I was a kid, that seemed like it was a hopeless uh, deficit and would never be overcome. But fortunately, the Packers have had a few decades combined of Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers, not to mention a couple decades of Lovey Smith and Dave Wanstead. And, uh, we're not about to relinquish that lead now that we've got it, Tags. And though he is not in the Favre Rogers class, Brent Hundley is going to be a top 10 fantasy quarterback this week. That's awesome. <laughs> that is really fun. <laughs> what's, what's your bold prediction, Bobby? Oh, so you're going last, right? Because yours is the best. Is that what you're saying? It is, it, it's, it's easily the best. <laughs> well, I mean, you are 100% on the season in bold predictions. I know we've just done it one week, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to, whatever yours is, I'm going to trust it. Um, so here's mine. I already alluded to it a little bit earlier. Um, I thought we were going to have a little bit more time to talk about defenses, but I love the Patriots defense for the rest of the season. And especially this week in week 10, the Patriots are going to be a top three defense special teams. Um, I, I do this bold predictions article every week where I make eight bold predictions and every week until last week I've made one defense special teams bold prediction last week I didn't have any that I thought were you know were worth using and I had a bunch of people tweet at me like hey who's your defense special teams that's the only reason I read this article because they killed it with defense special teams this year this week it is the Patriots their last four weeks 14 points allowed 17 points allowed seven points allowed to the Falcons 13 to the Chargers. They're killing it. They're getting after the quarterback that's seven sacks in the past four games they're getting uh, interceptions as well and they go against the offense that has given up the most fantasy points to opposing defenses this week, the Broncos, and they're starting Brock Osweiler, who is their third best quarterback. So I think it's going to be really ugly in Brock Osweiler's last start 
ever. It, it's probably going to be Brock Osweiler's last start ever, to be fair. Uh, they said it's a two week trial. Like that's that's <laughs> that's funny. And they're, they're, now they're saying it's until Paxton Lynch is ready. Like you guys have had him on your roster for two years. Like if he's if he's not ready by now, he's not going to be ready. But my my bold prediction comes down. It's actually three and one type deal uh, where it's all Giants. And I am betting that the Giants defense finishes top six on the week. And I'm also betting that Eli Manning and Sterling Shepard finish as top 10 options this week. I like it, man. You're, you're making it hard on yourself, though. You did three bold predictions at once. If you want to keep that 100 percent thing going, man. Yeah, it's going to be just stuck to one. It's going to be tough. And I'm going all out on a limb here thinking that the Giants are going to pop back on defense. I just think that with Joe Staley out for the 49ers with the receiving options they have, there's just so many holes on that team. Uh, it's going to be difficult for the Giants not to step up and have a, a game that I, I don't know how Ben McAdoo didn't get fired. Um, but I know that we, we, we did have Jake Seeley on earlier this week and he, he, he did warn me. He said that the Gi- Giants won't do it in season, that they will not do that. Uh, players right now are kind of playing for their jobs. They're playing for jobs next year um, because like the new coach, whoever that is, is going to come in and watch this tape. Uh, Janoris yeah. Jenkins was reinstated. There's just there's a lot of things that kind of play into this where it's like if they don't get it done here, I mean – how do you not fire the guy on the spot? Pat, what do you think about the Giants this week? Is that uh, is that too bold for you? You know, I think that I think the 49ers get win number one this week. I just think the Giants are such a train wreck. <laughs> and it seemed like with just a couple of exceptions, the team just totally quit on McAdoo last week. I don't see how they hammer the wheels back on this week. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that's all we have for today's show. Pat, we really appreciate you coming on. Oh, it was a pleasure talking to you guys. It's our pleasure, Pat. And if you guys want to follow Pat on Twitter, it's at Fitz underscore FF. And you can follow Tags and I at Bobby Fantasy Pro and at Mike Tagliere NFL. We've got one more show coming up this week. It's with Davis Maddock. We're going to be talking DFS, so make sure to tune in for that. Subscribe on iTunes if you haven't already. I also want to say thanks to the sponsor of today's show, SeatGeek. Make sure to download their app and use the promo code FANTASYPROS for $20 off your first purchase. For Mike Tagliere, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your football. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve.